All right, well, welcome to everybody this morning. And, uh, okay, so the, if you turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 12, we'll get ready here to, to start, Genesis 12. And um, we're told that that smell is the smell of drywall mud. So, <laughs> smells like smells like remodel to me, so... <laughs> All right, let's, uh, Genesis chapter 12. Let, first of all, let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning because you are our Father. We are your children. Lord, we need to be taught by our Father this morning. So teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis 12, verse 5. And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's wife and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Now, <clears throat> what we see here is Abram, we're now in a place now where Abram is leaving Haran. And as he's leaving, we see in verse 5 a description of this caravan that's, that, that Abram has. This is Abram's ca caravan. He gets the caravan on the move. We see in verse 5, there are certain, certain ones that are pointed out to us in this caravan. There's Sarai, his wife. There's Lot, his uncle's, his, his, his brother's son. And, and all of their all of the substance, it says, that they had gathered, substance that they had gathered in Haran. And then it's spoken about, which we didn't see before, souls that they had gotten in Haran. And it says they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And then we're told, into the land of Canaan they came. So we see here his caravan. And we, we, we see here something that, that started in the life of Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, that we didn't see before. And this is, this is not the, the same picture that we have when, Ere, when, when he, Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees. But now we see Abraham has been blessed by God in Haran. And we see that Abraham has, has been a good businessman. Can you imagine that? Jewish person being good businessman? What a surprise. Anyway, so here he is. And we see, and we read that 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 now he's acquired in Abraham, and he's le in in Haran, and he's leaving with what's called substance that they had gathered, and and not just that, but souls, and all of this Abraham has gotten in Haran, and once Abraham moved out of Ur of the Chaldees, God blessed Abraham, and he he has a lot now. He's got possessions, he's got servants, and to to see what kind of a person Abraham is or was, let's consider what Abraham might have done, what he might have said, but he didn't do this, but he might have said, you know, at this point in Abraham's life, he might have just said, you know, I've done pretty well for myself in Haran. Haran's been pretty good, pretty good to me. And, and look how many possessions and servants that I've gotten here since I got to Haran. Haran's good. If I just stayed in Haran, I could get more possessions. I could get more servants. I've really just begun. And God said that, after all, you could say, God said he'd bless me, and look, I'm blessed in Haran. And God said he'd make my name great, and everyone knows about me here in Haran, and my name will just get greater and greater if I just stay here. And who needs Canaan? He could have said that. Who needs Canaan? Haran, 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 better. I think I'll just settle down here in Haran and just make a life for myself here in Haran. Why not? Canaan, I don't know Canaan, it's unknown. Haran, I know, Haran is good. Let's just all stay here in Haran. See, he could have said that. That would have been a big temptation for Abraham because he could have just stopped there in Haran. And we can see that with all Abraham had gotten in Haran, that Abraham, he could have done that, but he did. 
Abraham did what the Lord Jesus Christ said and talked about in the parable of the, of the sower and the seed, in the parable of the word of God, as the different types of soil were being the different kinds of hearts of men were described. If you like, turn to that. In Luke chapter 8, verse 14 and 15, we're going to zero in on the last two types of soil here in, eight, in Luke 8, 14 through 15. And think about Abraham. And so here we see, it says here, that <clears throat> speaking about, the speaking about, and it's interesting how it starts about talking about the word of God, where it starts off in Luke 8, 14, it says, that which fell. It just fell. That which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, they go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And bring no fruit to perfection, but, on the, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. So you see, we see here that, it, 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 isn't that a good description of the word of God? It just fell. It fell. You know, we read the Bible and all of a sudden there's a verse that just, or a passage that just seems to stand out and it just seems to... To, to just light up for us. It's just right there. And what is that? That's the word of God that's been sent to us. That's the word of God that is for us. That's God sending the word. It falls, and it happens to meet a need in our lives. And it's just, just like some seed just fell onto our hearts. And the, the issue here in this parable is not, not if, the, if the word good or bad is the seed good or bad. The issue here is the, is the ground. And so it's really an issue of whether or not the Word of God is going to change a person depends on the heart of the person that the Word falls on. And Abraham's heart was not full of thorns. And so when the Word came to Abraham, if it was full of thorns, one type of thorn that's described in this parable is the cares of this life. The cares of this life. And so Abraham might have said, but he didn't, but he might have said, you know, I need to stay here and here. I need to stay because I'm an old man. Sarah is not exactly a spring chicken. And we have to think about our future. And we need to ensure that we're going to be well taken care of and going off to some unknown place of, uh, in, of, of uh, Canaan, that doesn't sound safe. That doesn't sound secure. And so what would have happened? The cares of this life would have choked the word of God. And, and when God said to Abraham, go, he wouldn't go. He would have stayed there in Haran and not obeyed God to go to Canaan. So another type of, of thorn that's described in this parable is called the riches of this life. The riches of this life. And so Abraham, if he would have said, you know, I came to Haran with nothing, and now look at me, I've got possessions, I've got servants, I've, uh, I've only just begun. I can make millions, he might have said. It reminds me of a Jewish friend of mine who once told me that he was an Israeli. He lived in Israel, and he had come to the U.S., he said, because he said in Israel was too small for him. He could only make millions in Israel. I mean, yeah, but in the U.S. he could make billions, he said. And when he said billions, he got right in my face, and he said billions like that. You know. He ended up losing it all here in the U.S. But through that, he found the Lord Jesus Christ. So he ended up get, really gaining a greater treasure. But if Abraham had said that he only had just begun to make his fortune in Haran, and that he decided, decided to stay in Haran so he could gain more riches, then it would have been the, the riches of this life, choking the word of God that said to Abraham, go, and Abraham would have stayed there in Haran and not obeyed God, not gone unto Canaan. And then the last type of thorns that are spoken about are the pleasures of this life. The pleasures of this life. So if Abraham would have said, look, I have servants. They wait on me hand and foot. If I want the pleasure of sleeping in all day, I say to the servants, take care of everything. It's done. If I want the pleasure of music, I call the musician servants. They entertain me. If I want the pleasure of certain foods, I call the cook servants. And they do that. And if I just stay here in Heron, I can build on this. I can make an, e an even greater life of just total pleasure. See, And if Abraham had said that, he, that he had just begun to build this life of pleasure in Haran, then 
he would have, then what would have happened? The, the, the pleasures of this life would have choked the word to Abraham, say, go to, to Canaan, and he wouldn't have done that. He would have stayed in Haran. But that was not Abraham. That was not Abraham. Abraham had cleaned out all those thorns in his heart of the cares of this life and the riches of this life and the pleasures of this life. And, 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 and now he, he all was in his, his mind and in his ears was that God told me to go. And he wasn't going to be held back. And so he didn't, like the, he didn't let the so-called good life hold him back. But, and prevent him from obeying God. He just went forward. And notice in verse 5 how there's a process there that's described. It says about Abraham that you know, he's leaving the good life of Haran. It's described like this. Verse 5. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And then it says, into the land of Canaan they came. Now those words tell a lot. Because first we read, they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and that expresses Abraham's intention, or their intention, to follow God. So Abraham set out to go into Canaan. That was what he wanted to do. He started off to follow God, to go into Canaan. And then separate from Abraham's start, we read, and into the land of Canaan they came. So those words express that Abraham followed through with his intention, that what he started out to do in following God, he did, and he went to Canaan. So just like Abraham went forth to go into Canaan with the first part of that verse, the intention, many people are like Abraham with a good start in the Christian life. They really want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. They start out well. It looks like they're going to go on, but they don't. And they stop. And there is no second part of the verse for them. But a certain hardness of life comes in, a temptation. And they're not like Abraham. And they don't have the into the land of Canaan they came. They give up. You know, I told you about the Hasidic rabbi who started off to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But then when he saw that it was going to cost him his wife and his house and his children and his family and his job and his congregation. He gave up. That is the heart described by the second group of the parable that we didn't read in Luke 8, if you still have that open to there, Luke 8, verse 13, where it describes this group as they on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time and temptation fall away. Those are the hearts described on the rocky ground, where they hear the word of God, they receive it with joy, but they don't have any root. And so they've really not counted the costs. They really not have deeply considered and come to the conclusion, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And then it says about them that for a while believe. And so these are the for a while believers, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But not Abraham. That's not verse 5 that says they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, into the land of Canaan they came. Now you see in verse 6, it describes for us where Abraham traveled when he came into Canaan. It says, And he, Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Moray. And then it says, And the Canaanite was then in the land. You know, that's an important statement at the end of verse 6. The Canaanite was then in the land. I mean, you have to ask, we have to ask the question, why did God put that bit of information there? The Canaanite was in the land. I mean, th th that phrase was not there to inform us that the Canaanite was in Canaan. I mean, wh you know, what do you expect to be in Canaan, you know? <laughs> Chinese? I mean, you know, it's like a hmm, Canaanite was in the land. That's not there for our information. <laughs> the phrase is not there for that purpose. So why is the phrase there? So why did he say that? The Canaanite was there in the, then in the land. Well, there's more to that phrase than just telling us that the Canaanite was in Canaan. So what's God trying to say to us? What's he trying to teach us? What's he trying to point out by that last part of that verse where it says, and the Canaanite was then in the land? To see the point, we have to first see the first part 
of the verse and the last part together. So it would go like this. And Abraham passed through the land and the Canaanite was in the land. See, the point is that the Canaanite is now going to be privileged. Why? Because he's going to be able to see firsthand what does a real follower of God look like. And that's Abraham. And so God brought this man Abraham into Canaan for the Canaanite, for the benefit of the Canaanite. And because wherever Abraham went, he influenced people toward God. He influenced people. You know, we see this, there was a wonderful, we're going to come to it, but there's a wonderful relationship which is described in Genesis between Abraham and his servant Eliezer. And we get a lot of insight into how Abraham influenced people that he came in contact with when we look at Eliezer. So if you turn, please, to Genesis 24 to get a little insight here. Genesis 24. We're going to focus a little bit on a servant in Abraham's house called Eliezer. So here in Genesis 24, verse 2 and 3, we see, we read these words. Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that's Eliezer, that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. I'll make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take, unto my, take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. So what do we see here? We see Abraham trusting Eliezer as a confidant. But why did, why did, Eli, why did Abraham trust Eliezer? Eliezer, because Abraham had a certain relationship with this man of confidence. Abraham and Eliezer, it wasn't just a boss-servant relationship. They were friends. They were friends, and Abraham trusted his friend. And we see how Abraham had Eliezer swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of earth. Now, how did Eliezer know who was the God of, uh, of heaven and the God of the earth. Because Abraham taught Eliezer, because he taught Eliezer that Jehovah Jesus is the God of heaven and the God of earth. Now drop down to verse 7 in Genesis 24. And here, here's Eliezer now speaking, not to Abraham, but to someone he's never met before. And he says these words all alone now. Eliezer is the lone, he is speaking, and he says, The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed, he's, he's telling, telling what, uh, wait a minute, <clears throat> I'm sorry, forget about what I just said. <laughs> this is Abraham continuing to talk to Eliezer. I'm confused, but that's the normal state. All right, so he's continuing to speak, and he says these words. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me and swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife uh, unto my son from then. So here, again, more, we see Abraham teaching Eliezer. He taught, he's teaching Eliezer. He's telling Eliezer very, very confidential things, very, very secret things, so to speak, between him and God, and he's teaching him what God had done for him, what God had spoken to him. See, he's showing him, he's influencing this man, Eliezer, as he does that. Now, finally, we come in verse 12 down there, where Eliezer speaks, and there, what I was trying to say before, he's all alone, Abraham's not there, but he's standing up for God. And he says, Eliezer says in verse 12, and he said, O Lord God of my masters. He's praying here. We see him praying. He said, I pray thee, send me good speed and show kindness unto my master Abraham. So whatever Abraham has said to Eliezer has stuck. And Eliezer is now a prayer to Jehovah Jesus. That's what we see here. And how did he know how to pray? And how did he know who to pray to? Abraham. Abraham taught Eliezer. Abraham taught him with words. Abraham taught him with examples. And then we said, and then we see in verse 27 that, well, again, now he's speaking. And, and Eliezer says, Blessed be, now he's giving testimony, blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his grace, I being in the way the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So here again we see Eliezer now standing up, standing up, 
for Jesus. And so why? Because again, Abraham taught him. Look at verse 42. Again, now he's in a large group, and he's, he's speaking here. He's not ashamed of Jehovah Jesus. He's confessing him to others. He's saying, when he says this, verse 42, And I came this day unto the well, and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now, if now thou do prosper my way, which I go. So what is he saying? He's saying, I prayed to the God of, of heaven and earth. And, 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 and so we see him not ashamed. See, that's what the Lord said. He said in Mark 8, 36 to 38, he said, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father. Why didn't Abraham, why, did, why, why didn't Eliezer lose his soul? Because he wasn't ashamed of Jehovah Jesus. He confessed him before others because Abraham had led him and taught him. And then you see in verse 48, and then what happened? He says, and I bowed down my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. So here we see Eliezer now worshiping and being very open about it as well. How did he know how to worship God? Again, Eliezer taught him. So where did Eliezer come from? We don't see, we don't see him now as Abraham's leaving uh, Haran. We didn't see him in, in Ur of the Chaldees. So where did he come from? Well, in Genesis 15:2, Eliezer is described as Eliezer of Damascus. Say Eliezer of Damascus. Now, if you look at a map and you sort of trace out Abraham's journey here, we can say down over here is Ur, Ur of the Chaldees, and then you go up here, and this is Haran, and then you come on your way down to Canaan, and that's Damascus, and then you finally arrive in Canaan. See? It's like a big horseshoe like that. Okay, so he hasn't come to Damascus yet, and Abraham is getting servants along the way. As it said in verse 5, this is the souls that they had gathered in Haran. So Abraham is going to go from Haran to Canaan, and he's going to pass through Damascus. And as he gets through Damascus, guess what? Another servant comes on board. This is Eliezer, and that's where he came from. And so that was the greatest thing that ever happened in the life of Eliezer when Abraham got to town, Damascus, and he became a servant of Abraham, Eliezer. And then because he became a servant of Abraham. Abraham influenced Eliezer, and Eliezer found God. And Eliezer's in heaven today because, because Abraham came to Damascus. And in Damascus, Eliezer had the opportunity to, 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 to be taken as a servant and then to be influenced by Abraham. So what we see in the relationship between Abraham and Eliezer is shows us that no matter where Abraham was, he influenced people for God. And that's why the verse 6 is so important when it ends with those words, Abraham passed through the land, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Does God care about the Canaanite? Yes, he cares about the Canaanite, because the Canaanite's part of the world that God spoke of when he said, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son in John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the Canaanite, it's part of the world. And as far as God was concerned, when Abraham came into Canaan, God saw that as the opportunity for the Canaanites to find God. And this is the same for us. It's exactly the same for us. We go to work, we end up at work at a certain place. What's God saying? God's saying, there's workers at that place, and you are my man to influence them for God. We end up in the hospital, and God says, there's nurses and orderlies and doctors at that place, and you are my man to influence them for God. Like Ed Landry, when he ended up at the University of Washington in the hospital for so many months, and he influenced many people for God. And God sends, sends us, 
like he sent Abraham to those places to be what is referred to and turn, it, well, turn to this if you like to in 2 Corinthians 5.20, but it's a verse you're familiar with, where it says, now then, 2 Corinthians 5.20, now then we are ambassadors for, God, for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be you reconciled to God. Just as Abraham was an ambassador for Jehovah Jesus, so are we. And just as Abraham beseeched Eliezer of Damascus uh, to be reconciled to Jehovah Jesus, so do we. And just as Abraham took the time to invest in Eliezer of Damascus by teaching him, by showing him, by taking him into confidence, and how to pray to God, who God is, how to pray to God, how to worship God, how to abide in God, so do we. And just as Abraham took Eliezer and made him a disciple of Jehovah Jesus, so should we, because everywhere Abraham went, he was doing that. He was influencing people to be reconciled to God. And notice in verse 7, Genesis 12, 7, where it then says, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And it says in verse 8, And he removed from thence unto a mountain in the east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, Ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So Abraham's in this place, this place in Canaan. And what does he do? He builds an altar. And there Abraham, then Abraham goes on to another place. And, and what does he do there? He builds another altar. So everywhere Abraham's going, he's building, in, he's building altars, altars to Jehovah Jesus. And later, we're going to find after Mount Moriah that he goes back to one of his altars that he's built in the past. So that means that when Abraham moved on, he left those altars in place. He didn't take them down. He left them there in place. And those altars were, were, were like signposts to everybody else who'd come along. What's that? Oh, that's one of those altars that Abraham built. Oh, so Abraham's building altars all over the land of Canaan. He builds them in Moray. He builds them in Mamre. He builds them in Bethel. He builds them in Moriah. And the Canaanite, he's watching He's watching Abraham. He's watching build those altars. He's watching Abraham maybe from far. He's worshiping. Look, Abraham's worshiping. There's come some smoke up from those altars, and he's seeing all these altars, and he's watching him. We can imagine the, the Canaanite asking Abraham, why are you building all these altars? What's with, what's with you? Why are you building all these altars? And Abraham would teach the Canaanite like he taught Eliezer. And he would say, he would, he would teach him about Jehovah Jesus, and he would say, you know, that, and, and as he would teach him, he would beg him, like he did Eliezer, be reconciled to God. The door's open for you. Now turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Because this is a description of what Abraham was doing as he was doing all this. That's a, okay. <clears throat> it's a description of Abraham, it's a description of us also. Now, 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16, where it says... Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now I won't tell you, when I finish reading this, I'm going to ask you a question, so if you weren't paying attention before, maybe now you could, but anyway. All right, and manifest, makes manifest the savor of his knowledge in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, to the other we are the savor of life unto life. Who is sufficient for these things? So, <clears throat> where it says there that God makes, uh, causes us to make manifest the savor of his knowledge, where are we making manifest the savor of his knowledge? First question, not a trick question. Where we are. Yeah, where we are. <laughs> the verse would be nice. <laughs> There's some the words. Every place. Every place. <laughs> where we are, every place. All right. Every place. He says every place. Okay. Now, second question. How many parties are we a saver to? How many parties? To the saved and 
Okay, two or one, two, three, how many? Huh? Okay. All right. So we look at this verse, look at the verse, okay, and then we'll see it here in verse 15. For we are who? We are unto who? God. We are unto God, a sweet savor. Okay, and then it says, and then, then it speaks of the other two, which are the saved and the lost. So we are a, a savor to God, to the saved, and to those who perish. Now, to the first, to, 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 we are a sweet savor to God and to them that, that uh, are saved. To the first two, we are the sweet savor, the sweet savor. To the last one, we're not such a sweet savor. <laughs> when Paul wrote this, he had, him, he had in his mind this practice of the Romans. The Romans had lots of practices, not just the crucifixion, many, many cruel things they came up with. They were the masters of cruelty. But anyway, whatever the Romans would conquer a land, they would divide their captives, you know, the ones who survived, they would divide their captives into two groups. And one group was a group that, that devoted themselves to, to absolute loyalty to the Romans. And they would become the servants of Rome. And the other group didn't, or whatever reason there was, they were the other group, and when they got back to Rome, they would be fed to the wild animals or the games in the Colosseum, they would die. So both groups would be marched along in the triumphant procession as they came back into Rome. And both groups would be in chains as they came back into Rome. So when they came to Rome, the citizens of the city there in Rome would line the streets and throw flowers and, 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 uh, and, and cheer the great procession, but they also had the practice of burning an incense. And they burned this incense. And so now Paul is focused down and zeroed down on this issue of the incense that's being burned when the procession comes back in. And when the one group of cap captives there, who were going to be the servants, when they smelled the incense, they knew that soon their chains would be taken off and they would be servants, they would live. So that, that incense was a savor of life unto life. They were going to live. Now, when, when the other group, when the other group, would, would uh, smell the incense, they knew that their chains would not be taken off and that they would be killed in the Colosseum, the games. And so when they smelled the same incense, they knew they would be killed. So for them, that incense meant that they would die. So that incense was for them a savor of death unto death. Now, when Abraham built his altars there in Canaan, and the, and the Canaanites who had responded to Abraham and were reconciled to God, when they saw those altars, Abraham and those altars were a savor of life unto life for them. But when those other Canaanites who rejected Abraham's message of reconciliation to God, when they saw those altars, that reminded them, especially as they saw the dead animals being sacrificed, of the judgment of God and that his altars and Abraham were for them a savor or a reminder or an indication of death unto death. See, now we don't build altars. I don't, well, some of us, but anyway. We don't build altars, but we pray at restaurants before we eat. And when the saved in a restaurant see us pray before we eat, then we're a savor of life unto life. And have you ever had that? Yeah, to you, some people, Christian will come up to you and say, oh, I saw you pray. And, and uh, they're, they're happy, you know, because we're a saver of life unto life. But when the law see us pray at restaurants, that upsets their meal <laughs> because we are a saver or a reminder or an indication of death unto death. So we don't literally build altars as Abraham did, but we do speak openly about the Lord Jesus Christ. And at any time and in any place, without regard for what anybody thinks, when we do that, then we are, as it says in 2 Corinthians 2.14, making manifest the savor of his knowledge in every place. In every place. And God smells it. And the saved smell it. And the lost, the perishing, smell it. Now, 
When the Canaanites saw Abraham's altars and the evidence of the animal sacrifices that Abraham had made, they were looking at Abraham's acts of devotion and worship to God. That's what they were seeing. And that was, as we mentioned, for the lost, a constant warning to them. It was a constant warning. Why? Because when they come up to this altar and they saw these dead, the evidence of the dead animals, that was a reminder to them of Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. But when they also saw the, these altars and they realized Abraham was, was making all these sacrifices to God, that was, in addition, a reminder of the second part of Romans 6.23, that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So they saw these evidences of Abraham and his devotion, and they were warned that the wages of sin was death, and they were also encouraged to follow Abraham and to receive the gift of eternal life through the substitutionary death. That was a message that came across from Abraham's uh, sacrifices there, that eternal life is all about a substitutionary death. And of course, the great final substitution came in the Lord Jesus Christ when he died for our sins. So when Abraham came into Canaan, God used Abraham to warn the people. And God never leaves anybody to perish without warning him or her in some way. And when Lot went into the city of Sodom, God used him to warn the people of Sodom. And when our lost neighbors see us going off to church, that's a warning to them as well, just like with Abraham. Now, so we come to verse 7. And in verse 7, we've, we're now at a place where Abraham has left Haran, and he's come into the land of Canaan. And the first thing we read about when Abraham has come into the land of Canaan, is verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. This was the first thing that happened to Abraham when he came into Canaan. Jehovah Jesus appears to Abraham. God appears to Abraham. That's like a welcome gift. <laughs> you know, you're coming into the land of Canaan, Abraham? Welcome. I appear to you. God did that. He appeared to Abraham. And Abraham, he, he'd never been to Canaan. He, 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 for Abraham, Canaan might as well be the end of the world for him. He'd never been there. And, but when he arrived, was this tremendous encouragement for Abraham, as the Lord Jesus Christ said. He says in Matthew 28, 19, he says, Go ye therefore into all the world, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, when God appeared to Abraham, he said, unto thy seed will I give this land. So God tells Abraham, this is the land that I promised. I'm going to give this land to your seed. Here it is. And Abraham might have looked around, and he, said, he might have said to himself, Nobody knows me. I'm a stranger here. And, the, the, and this is not a barren land, see? That's also another reason why it's pointed out for us here from verse 6. It says he came into the land of Canaan. There was just one problem with Abraham receiving the land of Canaan. The Canaanite was in the land. <laughs> and so he said, Abraham might have said, you know, there's inhabitants in this land. And, and no one has come up to me and said, you want to buy my land? <laughs> you know, I want to sell you my land or, uh, you know, and they just don't look like they're really preparing to move on to some other land. You know, like today, the Palestinians don't look like they're ready to move. And so he might have said, I have no idea how my seed is going to receive this land. No idea. But for Abraham, this is the thing about Abraham, where it spike, speaks about Abraham not staggering at the promise of God through unbelief. Abraham did not bother himself with the how God was going to make this land be possessed by his seed. Abraham saw, he saw only that God promised that the land would be his, and God chose not to fill Abraham in on how he was going to do it. He just, told, he just chose. That's a choice of God. God doesn't want to tell me how he's going to do it. That's fine. 
Because for Abraham, that was enough. Abraham could live with letting God be God. Abraham says, I got a great idea. Let's let God be God. And so in that, he's a good example for us. Abraham's a good example for us to trust and let God be God. And let God take care of the how he's going to fulfill his promises. Like Abraham, we just concern ourselves with the what of his promises and let God take care of the how of his promises. And then, and then Abraham responds to God, and he appears to him, who made him the promise, and in the land there, and what does he do? He builds an altar. Verse 7 is very important in the life of Abraham, because it says, and the Lord appeared unto Abraham, and then it says, and there builded he an altar. That's a very important word. There builded he an altar. Right in the place where God appeared to Abraham, right after God had renewed the promise to Abraham. There, that's why that word's important, there builded he an altar. He didn't leave that place and then say, you know, I really should build an altar there. I think I'll go back and build it. No, no. He said right then and there, he built an altar to God. And, and that shows something in Abraham of his immediate response to God, a response of worship and a response of appreciation to God. Abraham was not a man of delayed worship. He was not a man of delayed appreciation to God. Abraham was a man of immediate worship, immediate appreciation to God. As a matter of fact, this is the first act that Abraham did when he came into uh, uh, to Canaan. There built he an altar. Does that remind you of someone who we've already studied? Who? Yeah, that's it. Noah, in Genesis 8, 20, where it says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. Noah has just emerged from the ark. Noah has just set his foot on this new land. The first thing he does, builds an altar to the Lord. Abraham has just arrived in Canaan. The first thing he does, builds an altar unto the Lord. I don't know, when, whenever I travel, and I travel, and I open the door of my hotel room, first thing I ask, I just unconscious, I ask myself, let's see now, where will I have my devotions tomorrow? In what part of this room am I going to sit or whatever? There was something special about this altar for Abraham. And notice the last part of verse 7. There builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. Now, <clears throat> and, and it doesn't say that about the next altar that he built. So this altar was a memorial for Abraham. What was the memorial for? This altar was a memorial for the fact that at this place, at this time, the Lord appeared unto me. I will build an altar. And so at that place where Abraham saw Jehovah Jesus, he said, I'm not leaving this place till I build an altar to memorialize the fact that there I saw Jehovah Jesus. And then after Abraham left that place, uh, that, that altar helped Abraham. He remembered in his mind. I remember the altar I built there. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and whenever Abraham would maybe be in the area, that altar was kind of like a magnet for Abraham. Oh, I'm not so far off from that altar. I think we can take a little time. I can take a little time now and just go to that altar. I'd like to go to that altar. I want to sit there and look at that altar and remember the time when God appeared to me and remember when he promised me. And I got that altar there and I want to go there and just sit a while and just let it all come back again to me. Does that sound familiar? That's what the Lord's Supper is. The Lord's Supper is the returning to the altar. Let it all come back again, like a magnet in the week of our, of our journeying through the week. Let it all come back to me again. Let me remember again. This do in remembrance of me. That was one of Abraham's altar reminders. Altar reminders. And when we read our Bibles, or we're in church, or a Bible study, or whatever, and a certain verse just seems to come alive, and we see it in an application to us that we've never seen before. If you're into making notes in your Bible, it's a good thing to put a date by that verse. Maybe a little note, a reminder. That's an altar reminder. Just an altar reminder, like for Abraham. Just like Abraham, he's in the area, he could stop for that altar reminder, remember the day when God appeared to him. We come across that verse in our Bible, see the date, the altar reminder, and just once again remember the time when God spoke to us, like he did to Abraham. 
So what we see in verse 7 is a pattern that characterizes the relationship between God and Abraham. God makes promises to Abraham. They depend on Abraham's obedience to God. Abraham follows through. He makes God his first priority in life. In trusting obedience to the command, he leaves his roots, he leaves his friends, he leaves his family. And God speaks, God appears, and then he speaks to Abraham, and he guides and he helps Abraham in his life. That's the pattern we see. God becomes for Abraham the first priority. He becomes for Abraham his desire. He becomes for Abraham his delight in his life. And God takes time. Takes time, out of, <laughs> takes time out of God's busy schedule, you know. He takes time to fulfill Abraham's desire in his life, and we see God and Abraham just growing closer and closer to each other. That's the message when we look at the life of Abraham of how he's an example for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being the God of Abraham, and we pray, dear Lord, that that like you were to Abraham, you would be to us. And help us, Lord, to learn as we see Abraham on the way to get closer and closer to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.